Roller coasters are one of the backbones of amusement parks. A good roller coaster is often the most popular attraction at a park, and when new coasters are built, they lead to surges in guest attendance. Overall, they're a business win for the park and a win for the guest. These engineered machines are expensive, and parks buy roller coasters with the intent that they will last for decades and satisfy millions of parkgoers. But let me tell you the story of Drakenfire, a multi-million dollar roller coaster that opened at Busch Gardens Williamsburg in 1992 and was ultimately a failure. The ride was built by Aerodynamics, the same company who had built the park Loch Ness Monster in 1978 and Big Bad Wolf in 1984. Drakenfire was supposed to be the new headlining attraction at Busch Gardens. Compared to Loch Ness Monster, it featured a new and innovative design concept, but instead, it quickly grew a terrible reputation because of how rough and jarring it was. Drakenfire wouldn't even operate a full 10 years and closed forever in July of 1998. In this video, we'll take a deep dive into what went wrong with Drakenfire and how its designers tried to improve on the experience of something like Loch Ness Monster, which is the exact same ride model as Drakenfire and how that completely backfired. We'll also address common misconceptions about the origins of Drakenfire and other aspects of the ride's design that have been wrongly discussed in other videos and on various websites time and time again. If you wouldn't mind, please hit the like button as that will help the channel greatly against the YouTube algorithm. Alright, let's dig in. As I discussed in my problematic roller coasters video on Loch Ness Monster, which is the precursor to this video, Anheuser-Busch first opened Busch Gardens Williamsburg in 1975. This was after the company had purchased 3,000 acres of land off the James River, where they made a deal with the historical capital of Williamsburg that they'd build a residential area as well as a theme park on their new property to help boost tourism in the Williamsburg area. The park first opened as Busch Gardens the Old Country and was themed to different countries in Europe as they were in the 17th and 18th centuries. This was so the park didn't detract from the historical site in Williamsburg. The park performed exceptionally and exceeded guest attendance projections for the 1975 season. 1976 saw a major expansion of the park's German-themed area and introduced Oktoberfest, a new 10-acre land that debuted Fest House, a 21,000 square foot building for shows and dining. The new land also introduced eight new rides, two of which were roller coasters. The Kitty roller coaster Das Kotschkin, built by the Alan Herschel Company, and even Wildkatze, a Schwarzkopf Wildcat coaster, which was later removed in 1983 to make room for the swinging suspended roller coaster Big Bad Wolf, a ride I hope to one day cover in the problematic roller coaster series. As part of a massive expansion of the original Busch Gardens Park, Busch Gardens Tampa Bay, which was renamed Busch Gardens the Dark Continent in 1976, Anheuser-Busch purchased a $2 million roller coaster from the best ride manufacturer of the time, Aero Development. It opened as Python in 1976 and helped increase the Tampa Park's attendance by an overall 2.5% that season. And over at the Old Country, the park faced competition from the nearby King's Dominion, which had also opened in 1975 and featured more impressive roller coasters like the twin racing wooden coaster Rebel Yell and the launch shuttle loop coaster King Cobra that featured a state-of-the-art vertical loop that riders traversed both forwards and backwards. To remain competitive, Anheuser-Busch purchased an even larger looping roller coaster from Aero Development to open at the Old Country in 1978, Loch Ness Monster. Loch Ness Monster opened as the world's tallest and fastest roller coaster with the steepest drop in the world. It would also sport the world's first pair of interlocking vertical loops. For the time period, Loch Ness Monster was truly an engineering marvel. It pushed the limits of roller coaster design and manufacturing and did so successfully. The ride was an instant hit and even led to the formation of the American Coaster Enthusiasts or ACE, a renowned organization of roller coaster enthusiasts. Following the success of Loch Ness Monster, Anheuser-Busch would continue to expand the old country as part of their plan to attract not only new visitors, but also to convince regional guests to make return visits year after year. And the park had to remain competitive with the nearby King's Dominion that was just an hour away by car. In 1980, the old country added on to its villages themed to England, Scotland, France, and Germany when it debuted a new area themed to Italy. The Italian section was the park's third major expansion after opening in 1975, and along with it came a new 350 foot long bridge over the Rhine River to take guests from Oktoberfest to the new Italian themed area. As intended, the new section introduced an authentic Italian flavor with architecture from between the Roman and Renaissance time period, new dining and show experiences, and the all new Leonardo da Vinci's garden inventions which featured several new flat rides. 
1984 saw the addition of Big Bad Wolf, a swinging suspended roller coaster built by Arrow Huss, the same manufacturer that had built Loch Ness Monster. Arrow development had since been purchased by the German company Huss, hence the new name. The new state-of-the-art roller coaster where riders swung like a bat beneath the track was designed by Ron Toomer, the same man who designed Loch Ness Monster. Located in the park's Oktoberfest area, the coaster transported guests through an old German village as trains careened through different turns, sending the cars swinging all over. This was followed by a perfect ending where riders took an 80-foot plunge down a ravine sending trains at 48 miles per hour right over the Rhine River. As the years continued, the park would continue to grow in size and attract more visitors. 1987 saw the addition of Fiesta Italia, which was themed to a fair celebrating the return of Marco Polo to Italy after his visit to China. The new section would see the debut of Roman Rapids in 1988. Unfortunately, attendance at the old country would fall during the 1990 season, as a global recession and the Persian Gulf War shook the global economy. Rising gas prices and fears of terrorism kept Americans from traveling. To counteract the park's declining performance, the old country looked to install a major new roller coaster. On July 5th, 1991, the park announced it would be opening a new roller coaster in 1992. This unnamed roller coaster would be located in the Oktoberfest hamlet and would stand 150 feet tall, reach speeds of 60 miles per hour, feature a length of 3,550 feet, sport a camelback hump designed to prolong the feeling of near weightlessness, and feature several new ride elements like a wraparound corkscrew into a twisted first drop off the lift hill. The park would later announce that the ride would be named Drakenfire, with Draken meaning dragon in German. But most important to our story, Drakenfire would be built by Aerodynamics, the same company who had delivered Busch Gardens Loch Ness Monster as Aero Development and Big Bad Wolf as Aero Huss. It is commonly said that Drakenfire was originally designed and intended to be built by Bolliger and Mabillard, or BM, a Swiss roller coaster manufacturer, but this is not true. Today, BM is one of the most well regarded coaster manufacturers, and the company has delivered well over 100 roller coasters across the globe that are all safe, reliable, and excellent, with some being better than others. But back in 1990, when planning first started to add Drakenfire, B&M was still in its infancy. The company had only been founded two years prior in 1988, and while Walter Bolliger and Claude Mabillard, B&M's founders, had designed roller coasters like Z-Force at Six Flags Great America and Shockwave at Six Flags Magic Mountain during their time at Giovanola, B&M as a company had only built one roller coaster themselves the stand-up roller coaster Iron Wolf at Six Flags Great America, so there really wasn't much on the company's portfolio. I've heard time and time again that Anheuser-Busch approached B&M to build two sit-down looping roller coasters in the early 1990s, one at their Williamsburg Park and one at their Tampa Park, and that B&M had a ride design finalized for Williamsburg that would have been Drakenfire. But since B&M was both a new and conservative company, they would only deliver two new rides a year. For 1992, B&M was already set to deliver their first ever inverted roller coaster, Batman the Ride at Six Flags Great America, and Vortex, a stand-up roller coaster at Carowinds. And following that, B&M were already set to deliver another two roller coasters in 1993. So the company apparently told Anheuser-Busch that they could only do one of the two looping coasters, which ended up being Kumba at Busch Gardens Tampa Bay. The story continues that Anheuser-Busch then turned to Aerodynamics and asked the company to pick up up where BNM had left off and build BNM's Drakenfire. Arrow then allegedly tried to mimic BNM's original concept and layout down to the very support structure, ride elements, and even the ride's control system, but none of this is true. This story has been corroborated by the fact that both the Williamsburg and Tampa parks have received new rides in pairs such as Tampa's Monsu in 1996, followed by Williamsburg's Alpengeist in 1997, and then Tampa's Shikra in 2005, followed by Williamsburg's Griffin in 2007, among many other back-to-back -back similar editions. But this wasn't the case with Drakenfire. When Drakenfire was being built, the Busch Gardens parks had more individual liberty when it came to implementing new attractions. Now let me tell you what actually happened. Aerodynamics was never the second choice manufacturer that attempted to copy B&M's ride design. It was in fact the opposite. From day one of Drakenfire's planning, Arrow was a first choice manufacturer and Busch Gardens Williamsburg was actually reluctant to choose B&M. 
Now, B&M certainly offered a product that was a leap forward in terms of design and engineering, but their products were over double the cost of arrows. And as I just mentioned, B&M were still in their infancy as a company and had only built one roller coaster themselves. Whereas Busch Gardens Williamsburg had already built trust with Arrow after the company successfully delivered the park's two headlining roller coasters. Now, it's from what I understand that Busch Gardens Williamsburg still approached B&M early in the planning process as a potential bidder on the project, but those talks apparently fell through before any designs were submitted by BNM. Thus, fate would have it that Williamsburg went with what was considered the tried and trusted aerodynamics for Drakenfire, and Busch Gardens Tampa took what was considered more of a risk with BNM for Kumba, which absolutely ended up being the better choice. But from day one, Drakenfire was 100% an aero roller coaster that was designed from start to finish by Ron Toomer. There was no copying of a former BNM layout whatsoever. Aero initially proposed a mega looping roller coaster like Great American Scream Machine at Six Flags Great Adventure. But Williamsburg told Arrow to go back to the drawing board as they wanted their new coaster to take up less space. The park also wanted Arrow to differentiate the coaster from anything done before and give it a new flavor to echo in a new wave of roller coasters. Busch Gardens wanted new ride elements rather than the cookie cutter elements Arrow had used for years. A new ride vehicle design that deferred from what was on Loch Ness Monster and a more freestanding support structure unlike Arrow's classic lattice structure found on something like Loch Ness Monster. And I'm sure part of the park's ambitions were to help set Drakenfire apart from the new Anaconda at the nearby King's Dominion, which was under construction and opened in the spring of 1991. Anaconda is 100% a legacy arrow looping coaster with cookie cutter elements, arrows lattice support structure, and their older train design. To help meet Busch Gardens' requests, Drakenfire was the first roller coaster that arrow utilized computer-aided design, or CAD, to aid the design process. This milestone should have been achieved much earlier in Arrow's existence, but Ron Toomer was stubborn when it came to adopting new design practices, as he had stuck to drafting coasters by hand for years longer than he should have. Either way, the use of CAD allowed Ron Toomer and his team of engineers to step away from the copy and paste ride elements they had been using since the 1970s, and create new elements and inversions. With CAD, designers were able to define points in space, and bend the track around that and better calculate the speeds and g-forces that would be exerted along the track. CAD even allowed designers to virtually ride rock and fire to get a feel for what it would be like when riding it. Altogether, this aided the creation of the wraparound corkscrew off the lift hill, the Batwing, which was Arrow's name for a cobra roll, and the cutback, which started as a corkscrew, but the second half of the element was reversed, sending the train in the opposite direction it entered from. Better yet, the ride didn't feature a single vertical loop, a boomerang, which was Arrow's name of a Batwing, or a double corkscrew, which Arrow actually referred to as a corkscrew, with the classically awkward overbank turn leading into them. These elements had been copied and pasted on so many of Arrow's other looping coasters, and this really helped set Drakenfire apart from anything Arrow had ever built. For the support structure, Arrow subcontracted that work to a local structural engineering firm, just as they always had. At the time, Arrow did not do their own structural engineering. John A. Martin Associates had done the support design for several of Arrow's coasters, and took on the Drakenfire project. Lo and behold, Alan Schilke, who would go on to become a legendary coaster designer, worked at John A. Martin and helped design Drakenfire's structure as a consultant. This was ironic because Alan Schilke had previously applied to work at Arrow as a junior engineer, but Arrow wasn't impressed with Alan's lettering abilities when it came to drafting plans. Yet somehow, he still ended up working for Arrow anyway. Arrow would later hire Alan to work directly for them in 1994, where he went on to become Arrow's director of engineering and later created X, another coaster that will be covered in this video series. Construction of Drakenfire would begin in the fall of 1991 as work crews dug and poured the ride's concrete foundations around the five-acre site. This was followed by assembly of the ride's silver support structure, which featured no lattice structure and only steel support tubes. Well, except for one support on the mid-course brake run that contained service stairs. The lift hill even featured an inclined column design, where the support tubes were built at angles, with several A-frame supports rising from the same concrete foundations, giving the structure an accordion look. This certainly gave the ride a more free-floating appearance, just as the park desired. Arrow had even beat B&M to the support design since Kumba was B&M's first coaster to feature an inclined column design, but it opened one year after Drakenfire. Now of course, B&M's take was more elegant and more of a true inclined column design than Arrow's more industrial take where the A-frames still connected to one another laterally. 
Electric Blue Track would begin arriving to the job site and was erected atop the steel support structure. Unlike the new support styling, this track was the same design that Arrow had been using for decades, with cross ties that were still filled with welds. But as an upgrade to something like Loch Ness Monster, the track was manufactured with thicker cross ties that were consistently dense across all the ride's track. As requested, Arrow delivered a new generation of their looping coaster trains. These new fire ride trains were much more minimal, aerodynamic, and sleek compared to Arrow's boxier legacy looping coaster trains. They even featured wraparound bucket seating that better enclosed each rider's body. Altogether, the new design provided a more open feel that gave riders a fantastic view in every direction. For reference, these are the same trains used on Canyon Blaster at Adventure Dome in Las Vegas. Throughout the construction process, Busch Gardens heavily marketed Drakenfire, and apparently it was the park's largest promotional campaign in over a decade, dating back to Loch Ness Monster in 1978. The ride's main tagline was, quote, feel the heat. Construction of the new ride would continue smoothly as work progressed towards the grand opening on April 4th, 1992. The park paid a lot of attention to detail, to the point that with Drakenfire being located behind Big Bad Wolf's first portion, where trains passed through a German village, the park actually rebuilt a portion of the original village set as the backside of several buildings were only 2D facades. With this portion of ride now visible to guests walking the path to Drakenfire, the 2D rear-facing ends of these buildings were reconstructed with 3D facades Sods, making them look more realistic. Due to Drakenfire opening in the early spring rather than in June like Big Bad Wolf and Loch Ness Monster had, there were fears the coaster could valley during testing. This means the cold weather would cause trains to lose speed faster through the layout, and possibly lead to a scenario where a train doesn't have enough speed to climb over a hill, causing it to roll backwards and then valley back and forth between the two hills until coming to a stop. To counteract this, heaters were installed at both the top of the lift hill, on the brake run before the station, and I believe on the mid-course brake run. The heaters helped heat the wheels as well as the grease within the wheels which would allow them to spin more freely and prevent the possibility of a valley. This must have worked well enough as Drakenfire began testing and its 60 foot long trains began cycling the circuit over and over again. The ride also featured a state of the art control system that was one of Arrow's best yet, something I'll go more into detail on later in this video. On Friday, April 3rd, 1992, a special preview was held and members of the media and ACE, as well as various VIPs and high school students, got to experience Drakenfire before the public. On this first day of operation, reviews seemed to be favorable of the new intense and breathtaking attraction. Well, I think the Drakenfire is an outstanding coaster. It certainly is one of the most intense I've ever been on. All these unusual elements on here, the bat wing, the, the cutback, it is outstanding. This is spectacular. This is wild. This is wonderful. We like rides in tents, at least I do. Rides that never let you catch your breath. Rides that are full, gonzo, push the envelope. Incredible. It was fast, it was high, it was quick, it was, it was everything. But unfortunately, this initial reception wouldn't last. The problem was that even with all the new design and build innovations, Drakenfire was rough. Just watch riders' heads on this reverse POV from that preview day. The ride's official opening day wouldn't go very smoothly either. The next day on Saturday, April 4th, 1992, Drakenfire threw some sort of tantrum and did not open on time. The park had hired famous comedian Dana Carvey to officiate the ride's opening ceremonies. Dana Carvey, who you might know from Wayne's World, considered himself a roller coaster enthusiast and agreed to officiate the ride for free as long as he got to be the first public rider. While mechanics and electricians scrambled to get Drakenfire in a working order, Dana Carvey gave an impromptu stand-up comedy routine from the top of the Fest House stairs, where he impersonated Arnold Schwarzenegger and tried to distract the massive crowd eager to ride the new coaster. The story goes that Drakenfire would not open before Carvey had to leave town, and he didn't get to ride. Drakenfire would make its grand debut sometime shortly after this, where it drew a colossal crowd as expected. Thanks to three train operations and Arrow's wonderful ride programming, Drakenfire would begin delivering thrills to thousands and thousands of riders like clockwork. The coaster began with a small drop out of the station into a small banked left turnaround that led into the 150 foot tall lift hill. After a quick climb to the top, riders descended a 50 foot drop and entered the wraparound corkscrew, which inverted riders high in the air and led to a curving downward 145 foot drop all the way to ground level, where the train hit its top speed of 60 miles per hour. The train unbanked from the drop and rose into the ride's first camelback hump that exerted a perfect moment of zero gravity, sustained across the entire hill. 
The train descended towards the ground and roared into Arrow's first ever Batwing, which you probably know as a Cobra Roll, but that's what Arrow called the element. Riders ascended a half vertical loop into a half corkscrew at the top, which banked into another half corkscrew and then down another half vertical loop, taking the train back to ground level. This led into a flat section of track as the train banked to the left and then ascended an upward left hand turnaround into the mid course brake run. The brakes here would slow the train down as it got ready to enter the second half. Next was a diving drop to the right, followed by a quick snap to the left as the train raced through a diving corkscrew. The counterclockwise rotation of the corkscrew led into a quick left turn as the train continued to descend. Following was the new cutback element where the train ascended a large half corkscrew, then stalled upside down for a second, and then descended another half corkscrew screw that spit the train out in the opposite direction it entered the inversion. Next was a gentle right turn that angled the track underneath the diving corkscrew. After dropping back to ground level, the track quickly unbanked, sending riders through another counterclockwise corkscrew. The rotation of the corkscrew continued into a counterclockwise fast-paced helix that started with an ascend, and then a quick descend back to ground. After completing the helix, the train ascended a gentle hill, followed by a curving drop to the right which led into a curving leap into the final brake run ending the ride. But as I mentioned earlier, the problem from day one was that Drakenfire was rough. So even with its cool layout that was probably ahead of its time, that featured good pacing and an overall intense experience, the track profiling was jarring and would cause riders to bash their heads or necks on the over the shoulder restraints. On Saturday, April 13th, just a week after the ride had opened, three young women were taken to a Williamsburg hospital following their rides on Drakenfire. Two of the women had ridden together, and the third rider was aboard another cycle of the coaster. All three complained of neck pain following their ride. David Conrad, a spokesman for Busch Gardens, said the incidents were not caused by any malfunction in the new roller coaster, and that Drakenfire had already carried over 25,000 passengers since opening. So pretty much Drakenfire had no operational issues, but the ride was just rough in nature. Word would begin spreading about how rough Drakenfire was, and this quickly hurt the coaster's reputation. I hear that the ride remained quite popular in its opening year, and attracted a healthy crowd. But each year afterwards, the ride grew less and less popular. To help improve the experience, the park banned earrings from being worn while riding Drakenfire. Fire. Riders were allegedly asked to remove all clip-on earrings before riding and had to keep their heads firmly pressed against their headrest during the ride. In 1995, David Ordonio, a Drakenfire survivor from Maryland, attempted to sue Busch Gardens, Aerodynamics, and William N. Carlson, who was a technical consultant, for $7 million US dollars, which was more than what Busch Gardens had paid to build Drakenfire in the first place. This was because he had, quote, sustained grievous injury as a rider on Drakenfire. He filed the lawsuit almost two years after the date his alleged injury happened, so I'd assume that his injury took place in 1993. His suit charged that Drakenfire did not have an adequate passenger restraint system that prevented violent head and neck movement, and that Busch Gardens knew Drakenfire had previously caused injuries and knowingly disregarded such information as to not decrease the gate revenues. However, I don't believe the lawsuit was ever officially served to Busch Gardens. So why exactly was Drakenfire so rough? Unlike Arrow's older roller coasters that were designed by hand, Drakenfire's track layout was designed using CAD, which allowed the ride's designers and engineers to calculate and predict the speeds and g-forces exerted at each location of track more accurately. Drakenfire also featured a new generation ride vehicle, so why wasn't Drakenfire as smooth as a B&M coaster that was also designed using CAD? Well, even though Arrow used CAD to design Drakenfire, the problem was that the company had stuck to many of their outdated design methods. In my problematic roller coasters video on Loch Ness Monster, I detailed how Arrow's coasters were built using straight lines and circles. The more proper name for this design method is tangent radius design. It means that the track of a roller coaster either follows a tangent, so a straight line, or a curve with a consistent radius, so a circle. A curve applies to any turn to the left or right, the pull-in of a drop as it grows steeper, and the curve of a valley between two hills. Each of these curves would have its own unique radius, but the radius through each individual curve was consistent the entire way through, from start to finish. For example, the first drop of Loch Ness Monster begins with a curve with constant radius that pitches the track from a 0 degree slope to a 55 degree slope. Then straight track as the track descends at a constant 55 degree slope, and then another curve with constant radius that pitches the track from a 55 degree slope back to zero. More modern roller coasters like the ones that BNM builds do not utilize tangent radius design and feature something called compounding curves. 
So rather than each curve following a consistent radius, the radius of each curve is continuously changing. This is how we get something like a parabolic airtime hill, where the start and finish of a hill's peak are wider to account for higher speed, and the very peak of the hill features a smaller radius since the train is traveling slower. This allows for a consistent amount of airtime for riders in the middle cars. The same also happens during a valley between two hills, and the very bottom of the curve will be wider to account for the train's higher speeds, which means a consistent number of g-forces are applied throughout the curve from start to finish. But Aero's coasters utilize tangent radius design because it was easier to calculate this by hand, and mainly due to track fabrication limitations that required Aero's track fabricators to bend track by hand. So if Aero needed a section of track to feature a 30-foot radius, they'd bend the track and hold a wooden board that represented a 30-foot radius against the bent steel. If the track matched the board, the piece was ready to go. Or if the track didn't match, fabricators would heat the track back up and bend it further. Whereas today's roller coasters are fabricated almost entirely with the use of computers and automated heavy machinery that allow for curves to feature ever-changing radiuses. To calculate the radius of a curve, Aero most likely used the formula for centripetal acceleration, otherwise known as g-force. The formula is centripetal acceleration equals velocity squared divided by radius. Designers would most likely have a desired centripetal acceleration or g-force they'd want a curve to achieve. With Loch Ness Monster, it's advertised that the ride exerts a max of 3.5 g's. So let's assume that occurs at the bottom of the first drop. To make this happen, designers would first use physics equations to accurately estimate the speed of trains at the bottom of the first drop based on the change in height. Loch Ness Monster reaches 60 miles per hour on its first drop, which is 88 feet per second. In our equation, I will plug in 88 feet per second for velocity. 3.5 g's means 3.5 times the acceleration of gravity, which in imperial units is 32.174 feet per second squared. 3.5 times that is 112.609 feet per second squared. So I'll plug that in for our equation for centripetal acceleration. We now solve for the unknown radius, which ends up being 68.77 feet. In the case of bending track rails by hand, I'm certain the radius would be rounded to the next whole number which just so happens to be 69 feet, very nice. Hypothetically, track fabricators would then bend the track of the section to match the necessary 69 foot radius. So this is how Loch Ness Monster was designed and built in 1978, and it was great because it allowed for the creation of a large steel coaster, even with the technological limitations of that time period. But it does mean that Loch Ness Monster is not the smoothest, as transitioning from a continuous radius to another radius, or from a radius to a straight line, or vice versa, causes jerk. Jerk is rapid changes in acceleration, and it quite literally causes a rider's body to jerk as the train rides through a transition. This is because the transition between a curb or straight track needs to begin and end gradually to spread the change in acceleration over a longer period of track, but consistent radiuses do not allow for that. On Loch Ness Monster, that is okay because most of the ride is pretty tame, and even during the ride's faster and more intense moments, the track follows a relatively simple path without quick twists or turns which keeps it relatively smooth. But for Drakenfire, it appears that Arrow continued to use tangent radius design even if the ride was designed with CAD. So with Drakenfire featuring a more fast pace and intense track layout, the jerking during the ride's many transitions were far more prominent, like this turn into the mid-course brake run. Rather than this turn featuring a smooth curve with an ever-changing radius to account for changes in angle or speed, it seems to consist of several curves hastily put together. First is the lower part of the turn where the track turns left but doesn't climb upward which begins with a jerk as the train transitions from straight track into the curve's consistent radius. Then the curve suddenly pitches upward, causing a jerk as the ascent grows steeper. And because this jerk happens sideways, it throws riders' heads side to side against the over-the-shoulder restraint. On top of Drakenfire's sudden changes in acceleration, the coaster didn't feature heartlining like the majority of Aero's other coasters. Heartlining is where the rotation of track, say as it banks to the right or left, places a rider's heart, or really their chest, at the center of rotation. This is important because a rider's chest is their center of mass. More modern roller coasters, like the ones that B&M build, feature heartlining and it means that the track of a coaster rotates around your center of mass. This reduces the lateral forces exerted on riders and helps avoid something called headbanging, where riders' heads or necks bash against their over-the-shoulder restraints. So with drop and fire lacking heartlining, riders would experience a large amount of neck or head bashing as the track rotated left or right. As riders were rotating around the track, rather than the track rotating around the riders, 
And keep in mind that changes in banking occurred mainly during transitions, where the ride's tangent radius design applied rapid changes in acceleration between different curves. Ultimately, it was a recipe for disaster, and with Drakenfire Fire featuring several rapid fire transitions with changes in banking, riders' heads went flying, whereas the older Loch Ness Monster wasn't nearly as rough because it was a gentler coaster with less fast paced transitions and turns. Arrow wouldn't begin using heartlining in their track design until later in the 1990s. For the coasters Aero built before Drakenfire, the company did not implement heartlining into their track designs, because it was most likely harder to design for this by hand, and because designers were more concerned about the forces that trains would exert on the track and structure, and less so the riders. This was more acceptable in the 1970s when Aero's coasters weren't as large and intense, and also because manufacturing and material limitations of the time meant it was harder and much more expensive to build stronger track and support structures. But as time continued, Aero stuck really hard to their obsolete design practices. While designing Drakenfire, Aero still stuck to their design method where they used one of the coaster's two running rails as the design reference point. This means that all calculated g-forces and changes in acceleration were based off a point where the wheels rode the track, a good distance away from a rider's center of mass. Aero would essentially design one rail of the coaster and have the other rail follow it. On turns, Aero would use the low rail, which was the inside rail of the turn as the reference point, and the high rail, or outside rail, was designed to follow it based on the three foot width of the track. This design method was great during the 1970s as it gave designers an accurate gauge of the forces that trains would exert on their track and structure, just as the designers wanted to calculate, as the reference point they were using is literally where a train applies forces. But as I just mentioned, it meant the reference point was a good distance away from a rider's center of mass. Whereas to achieve a heartline design, the design reference point must be that of the average chest level of riders. G-forces and acceleration would be calculated against this reference point, and the ride's track would have to rotate around this reference point. This is why rides designed using heartlining are far smoother than an aero coaster designed around its low rail as a reference point, as heartlined coasters are designed to keep the rider comfortable, whereas low rail coasters are more so designed to keep the train's track and structure happy. Of course, today's heartlined coasters keep their train's track and structure happy as well as the riders, because better design, manufacturing, and material choices are available to keep the trains and structure strong enough to account for heartlining. Another great thing with the Heartline design is that when track banks from left to right or vice versa, the design reference point does not change. So as you ride through such a transition, the forces applied to a rider center of mass are smoothly accounted for through the entire transition. But with Aero's low rail design, a transition like this means the opposite rail suddenly becomes the new low rail, which means the new low rail becomes the new design reference point. So in such a transition, the reference point suddenly shifts three feet to the opposite rail. Let's take this right hand turn on Drakenfire following the cutback. Arrow's point of reference that this turn was designed around was the low rail here, which is on the inside of the turn. The high rail, or the outside rail on this turn, was designed to simply follow the inside rail. As we continue to the transition from this right hand turn into the counterclockwise corkscrew, the track on banks and now the opposite rail becomes the point of reference. So now the track is being designed based on the g-forces and changes in acceleration being applied here. But in doing so, the point of reference suddenly switches 3 feet to the left since we swapped which rail was the reference point. Add in the fact that the shifting reference point is lower than where the forces are applied to riders, and it pretty much instantly results in a rough and uncomfortable transition. So while Aero certainly evolved from hand drafting designs to doing them with CAD for Drakenfire, they really needed to improve the way they designed their coasters, especially as their coasters grew larger and more intense. Drakenfire's new trains also weren't much of a leap forward when it came to their abilities to track a circuit. While technically a new generation vehicle, the trains were only new in their car bodies and seating. The car's steel frame and chassis, as well as the wheel assemblies underneath each car, were identical or nearly identical to Arrow's original looping coaster trains, and so were the restraints that secured riders. So the trains were functionally the same as Loch Ness Monster's trains. They featured a trailer design where each car had one axle at the front, and the rear of each car was 
were supported by the axle of the car behind it, which is why the trains feature a dummy axle at the rear, which acts similarly to a zero car on B&M's trains, just that it's at the back of the train instead. The axles of each car were able to steer to the left and right thanks to a sensor spindle, which was a large machined pin that held the axle to the chassis. The different wheel assemblies were then individually capable of pitching up and down. Arrow would become infamous for pushing their train designs to their limits. When the company unveiled Magnum XL 200 at Cedar Point in 1989, the world's first roller coaster to top 200 feet in height, its trains were essentially no different than what Arrow had used on their smaller mine train coasters. This caused a lot of issues that I go more into detail on in my problematic coasters video on Magnum. While Drakenfire also pushed its trains to their limit, the ride would occasionally break center spindle pins, probably due to the large number of forces placed on them by the wheels and axles. Meanwhile, in Loch Ness Monster's 45 years of operation, the coaster has never broken a center spindle once, and a lot of that probably has to do with the fact that the train was essentially the same as Loch Ness Monster's, and that Drakenfire applied far more forces on its trains, whereas a B&M train could probably handle those forces without any issue. Part of the problem may have been due to the gaps between wheels and the running rails, with the side running guide wheels and under running upstop wheels both having gaps between them and the running rails. Rides like Drakenfire featured no bushings or springs in their wheel assemblies, meaning the wheels were all fixed in their locations. So in order to ride around something like a turn, a gap was necessary so that the wheel assembly wouldn't get jammed up due to a build in pressure. But it can lead to something called axle hunt, where an axle bounces back and forth between the running rails, which can increase the roughness of a coaster, and I'd imagine it places more forces on the axle and its connecting components, like the center spindle that accounts for left and right pitching of each axle. But among all these issues, the new trains at least featured cool red runner lights along the sides of each car. Each of these were powered by moped batteries mounted underneath each car. I unfortunately don't know of any photos or videos of Drakenfire operating at night, but I hear that it was quite a cool visual effect. To help alleviate the coaster's roughness, Busch Gardens had Drakenfire heavily modified for the 1995 season. The major change was that the diving corkscrew immediately off the mid-course brake run was removed, and the drop itself off the mid-course was heavily modified. This section was replaced with a long and shallow descent towards the cutback, along with some trim brakes that artificially removed the speed normally lost during the diving corkscrew. This alteration meant the removal of the sharp snap both into and exiting the diving corkscrew. I hear this helped a good amount, but that the coaster still featured other moments that were even rougher, such as the turn into the mid-course brake run or the sharp transition into the ride's last corkscrew. Another modification was the addition of some sort of cross bracing in the track of the upper portion of the Batwing. It appears this was done for the 1996 season, as this was the Batwing in 1995, and this was the Batwing in 1996. On both ends of the element, a large large amount of the upper half loop and half corkscrew were unsupported, which would cause the track to sway and bend by a large amount. The amount of unsupported track was so long that the entire 60 foot long train would fit within the unsupported spans of track with more room to spare. This wasn't the first time Arrow's track had to be strengthened after a coaster had been built. It was common for their coasters to require additional cross ties that connect the running rails to the large center spine. Or on the mega looping coasters that Arrow had built for Six Flags, the tops of every single vertical loop received rigid reinforcement that added additional connections between each cross tie, as well as diagonal connections between the cross ties and center spine. But the additional cross bracing added to Drakenfire's Batwing appears different than that of the Six Flags Mega Loopers. Unfortunately, there aren't many high resolution images of Drakenfire's bracing, but each cross brace appears to feature some sort of spring. So the cross bracing may have acted as a shock absorber that helped absorb the sway of the unsupported track spans, rather than try to prevent any sway completely. Drakenfire also featured Arrow's classic anti-rollback system, which is what prevents a train from rolling backwards down the lift hill for any reason. On the track of the lift hill was a steel rack with asymmetric teeth. Metal paws below the train, or anti-rollback dogs, slide between the asymmetric teeth of the rack while traveling forward. If a train stops on the lift hill, the paws lock into the asymmetric teeth as they cannot slide over them in the backwards direction. This holds the train in place and prevents it from rolling backwards down the lift hill. But Arrow's anti-rollback system generated a lot of noise. 
Now, I personally love this lift noise, and there's nothing that beats the sound of an arrow coaster climbing its lift hill. But the problem was that houses were nearby Drakenfire's lift hill in the Kings Mill residential area that Anheuser-Busch had built. Early in the morning, before each day of operation, Drakenfire would be tested to get its green tag for the day. This would allow the coaster to open up for riders. But the loud noise of the anti-rollback so early in the morning was quite disturbing for nearby residents. From 1992 to I believe roughly 1995, Drakenfire operated with its original Aero anti-rollback system. And then I believe in 1996, the ride started running a silent anti-rollback system. Compare this video from 1995 where the anti-rollbacks are audible to this video from 1996 where the train quietly climbs the lift hill. To accomplish this, a new system was added like what Intamin uses on their roller coasters, where a wheel underneath the train would roll against the strip on the lift hill, which would power an electromagnet to keep the pawls elevated. This way, pawls wouldn't clank against the teeth of the steel rack. But if the rate of ascent slowed too much, or the train stopped, the electromagnet would lose power and the pawl would fall back into position to engage the steel rack, preventing the train from rolling backwards down the lift hill. In these photos from 1996, notice the gray strip of steel added next to the anti-rollback teeth. This is where the wheel of the new silent anti-rollback system would roll against. Compare this to how the anti-rollback teeth used to look, where no steel strip is present next to the rollback teeth. But amongst all the ride's issues, the ride did have one saving grace, and that was its stellar control system and overall rider capacity. In my last video on Loch Ness Monster, I discussed the difference between an older Relay Logic control system, which Loch Ness Monster opened with, and newer PLC systems or programmable logic controllers. Relay Logic basically consists of switches around a ride's track that turn on or off certain electrical circuits, where PLCs are specialized computers that automate processes by receiving data through various inputs, making decisions based on the collected data, and then producing outputs based on its decisions. Well, Drakenfire opened right away with the state-of-the-art dual processor Allen Bradley PLC system that Arrow had been perfecting over the years, as the same system had also been used on Great American Scream Machine at Six Flags Great Adventure and Viper at Six Flags Magic Mountain. I believe these systems were the next generation of the single processor Westinghouse PLC system used on Shockwave at Six Flags Great America. So no, Drakenfire did not feel feature a ripoff of B&M's control system, and it worked exceptionally well. Arrow had always built high capacity and rather reliable rides, and Drakenfire was the company's magnum opus from a control standpoint. Drakenfire's control system was designed and programmed by Arrow's then controls engineer, Kevin Russell. In an interview with Ace, Kevin Russell described Drakenfire's control system as his pinnacle work. Among many things, the PLC on Drakenfire controlled the ride's block zone system. For those of you who are unfamiliar, a block zone is a section of ride that only one train may occupy. At the end of a block zone is a method to stop a train in case the block zone ahead is still occupied. This is the safety system that prevents roller coaster trains from colliding with one another. These were the block zones of Drakenfire. First was the station, then A block, which was the ride's main lift hill, followed by B block, which ran from the crest of the lift hill to the mid-course brake run after the Batwing. Next was C block, which was from the end of the mid-course brake run to the safety brake run at the end of the ride. And last was D block, which was the ready break right before the station. So a total of five block zones that allowed Drakenfire to comfortably operate its three 28 passenger trains. Unlike Loch Ness Monster, Drakenfire featured a longer final brake run with enough block zones that allowed the ride to stack two trains on the final brake run, which greatly reduced the chance of a train stopping mid-ride and the entire attraction cascading because the smallest of a holdup occurred in the load station. And unlike earlier aero coasters that relied on downward slope track on the brake run and station, to advance trains forward using gravity, Drakenfire featured vertically mounted tire drives in the ready brakes and load station that quickly advanced trains forward. The ride also featured mini blocks between D block and the load station, which allowed for the train in D block to advance into the station simultaneously as the train ahead dispatched from the station. This, combined with the tire drives, cut down the amount of idle time between when a train dispatched from the station to when the next train parked, which increased the amount of time operators had to actually unload and load each train. Altogether, this allowed operating crews at Drakenfire to actually achieve and exceed its published theoretical capacity of 2,000 riders per hour, whereas a large majority of roller 
coasters ever built never meet their theoretical capacities. To achieve at least 2,000 riders per hour, it means that at least 72 trains need to be dispatched from the station at a rate of one dispatch every 50 seconds. The main lift hill was also rather quick, which I'm sure made the 50 second interval possible, as trains could dispatch from the station as soon as the train ahead passed the B block enter proximity sensor located here. This was the location where gravity took over as trains came off the lift hill and when trains had fully transitioned from A block into B block. But unfortunately, the ride's extravagant control system and high capacity really meant nothing if there was no one lining up to ride Drakenfire. And over time, that's what began to happen. Now, there were certainly many coaster enthusiasts who loved Drakenfire. I probably would have been one of them, but most of the general public stayed away from Drakenfire. Towards the end of Drakenfire's career, it was very easy to remain aboard the coaster for dozens of rides in a row because no one was waiting in line for it. The ride just had that bad of a reputation. Park spokeswoman Deborah DeMarco made a statement that Drakenfire was the least popular of the park's major coasters. In 1997, Busch Gardens would open Alpengeist, a massive inverted roller coaster built by BNM. Alpengeist smoothly traversed its track, well maybe except for its powerful Cobra roll, which further set the tone for just how rough and terrible Drakenfire was. In July of 1998, a 43-year-old man suffered a brain injury called an acute subdural hematoma while riding Drakenfire. Coincidentally, Busch Gardens would close down Drakenfire fire indefinitely in July of 1998, and the ride never reopened. It simply sat abandoned in the very back of the park while Alpengeist and the new Apollo's Chariot, a B&M hypercoaster introduced at the park in 1999, carried thrill seekers into the 21st century. The park further cited that Drakenfire's declining popularity and growing maintenance costs were the reason for the closure. With the ride sitting closed, rumors in early 1999 began circulating that Busch Gardens might be attempting to further modify Drakenfire in an attempt to make it smoother, but this never came to be, and it's a real shame that modifications were never made as Arrow had already begun making smoother looping coasters. In 1996, Arrow opened a coaster by the name of Roller Coaster in Kuwait. The ride featured a radically different design profile and appeared to feature a much smoother track design. I believe it was at this point when Alan Schilke got involved with Arrow's track designs and him and other engineers incorporated force vector design, compounding curves, and heartlining into Arrow's coasters. Arrow would introduce Roadrunner Express at Six Flags Fiesta Texas in 1997, which is a very smooth and enjoyable mine train roller coaster, and then the famous Tennessee Tornado at Dollywood in 1999, a large, smooth, and enjoyable arrow looping coaster. With Arrow's more modern method of designing and building their roller coasters, it may have been possible for them to renovate Drakenfire with an altered track profiling that may have increased its smoothness but it's unknown if talks between Busch Gardens and Arrow ever occurred. It would have also been great to see Drakenfire's restraints replaced with a vest style restraint that we've seen introduced on roller coasters built by the Dutch manufacturer Vacoma. Like Arrow's coasters, Vacoma, who was essentially an offshoot of Arrow, had built many rough roller coasters themselves, and many parks have purchased new trains from Vacoma with these new vest restraints. Vest restraints more tightly secure a rider's upper body, which prevents it from sliding around as much. And most importantly, the vests eliminate the possibility of headbanging. Vest restraints may have meant the track reprofiling wouldn't have been necessary to make Drock and Fire more comfortable and enjoyable. And if the park was feeling really courageous, lap bars might have been even cooler. In August of 1999, it was found that Busch Gardens had listed Drock and Fire for sale. From what I've heard, an interested buyer did approach the park about acquiring the coaster, but the coaster speed issues that I talked about earlier did not help sway this interested party. I believe that the heaters the park had installed on the lift hill and D block during the coaster's initial testing in 1992 had had long since been removed, and they probably would have been useful while selling the coaster. When the park went to cycle Drakenfire for the interested buyer, a train valleyed on the ascent into the mid-course brake run. This was the location that Drakenfire was sensitive to valleying at when operating in cold or windy weather. While this hill is a good amount lower than the Batwing, the top of the hill is essentially flat, meaning the train needs more energy to fully ride up the hill. After the train valleyed, a team of maintenance members began winching the train back up the incline, but this was enough to scare away the potential buyer, and the coaster never sold to a theme park operator. In 2002, after sitting closed for over three years, Drakenfire was finally dismantled and the coaster's steel was recycled. Ever since, Drakenfire's plot of land has remained empty and abandoned. The park did keep the original station and storage buildings in place, and who knows, maybe they will be used on another coaster or attraction in the near future. Since closing Drakenfire, Busch Gardens has opened six new roller coasters with a seventh on the way, and none of them were placed in Drakenfire's original location. As of now, the current rumor suggests a new hybrid roller coaster by Rocky Mountain Construction or RMC, similar to Iron Gwazi at Busch Gardens Tampa, may be built in Drakenfire's old spot. That'll certainly be interesting to see if that becomes true. And if something 
is ever built in this location, it would be awesome to see some sort of nod given to Drakenfire, whether that be through the new attraction's name, theme, or color scheme. But if something is ever built, whatever this ride is, it'll have to be quiet. Among the complaints Drakenfire used to receive about its loud anti-rollback system, even the screams of riders could be disturbing to nearby residents. And this may be why the park has never built anything in its former location, not because the location was too far off the beaten path. So there you have it, the story of the oh-so-problematic Drakenfire, a roller coaster that from day one was 100% an Arrow roller coaster designed by Ron Toomer, and it was not Arrow's attempt at picking up where BNM had left off. I hope you enjoyed this video, and comment down below if you ever got the chance to ride Drakenfire and what you thought of it. Please be sure to like the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this one. Alright, thanks for watching everyone, I'll catch you guys in the next one, peace.